Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Huntsman. <laughs> I'm Nick Burns. I'm a professor at the Kennedy School. Delighted to be here at the 92nd Street Y. We're going to have a conversation about America's place in the world tonight, about our foreign policy priorities. We're going to focus on China for a specific reason. One is that John has considerable experience in Asia and China. The second is, I think both of us agree, that China is going to be the most important country for the United States for the next half century. If you think about China's weight economically, its military power, its growing military power, its sense of self, its historic role as the middle kingdom, I think there's little question that for the next 50, maybe even 100 years, there'll be two dominant countries in the world, the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. So how we view China, how we conduct our relationship, whether we can build a sense of partnership and defend our interests in tough times, that's going to be the test of American leadership, Republican or Democrat, going forward. But before we begin that conversation, I want to say a word about Governor Huntsman. Uh, you heard a brief description of his record of public service. He and his family have built a company, and so he has been in the private sector. But much of his life that we have seen, of course, in public is in the public arena. And you, this, fo this focus on Asia as ambassador to Singapore, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, of, of Commerce, excuse me, for Asia, as our Deputy U.S. Trade Negotiator, and also his service as Ambassador to China for President Obama, he's someone who has a deep, intimate knowledge of the part of the world that now is largely regarded by most people um, in the American foreign policy establishment as the most important area for the United States. Uh, so I thought I'd start at the beginning. I thought I'd ask Governor Huntsman why public service? Why the Mandarin language, Chinese language? Why Asia, when you had lots of other options as a young man? And welcome. Well, th thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. And as you were reciting my, uh, my, my resume, uh, I'm reminded that my wife is uh, often asking when I'm going to get a real job during, <laughs> during my, my, my professional trajectory. I sounded a little bit like the embodiment of everything Donald Trump hates about America. <laughs> the, guy, the guy who negotiated all those bad deals with the Chinese and others. But uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. And before we get into that, Nick, uh, let me just say what an honor it is being with uh, the person who I described earlier as not being one of the best in class, but being the best in class in terms of a premier American diplomat. And it's a great pleasure to, to be with you. And I'm violating one of Winston Churchill's principles <laughs> by being here when he said, never should you be interviewed by somebody who knows more about the subject matter than you do. Which is, which is <laughs> so, not the case tonight, so, so don't worry. So here I am. <laughs> but I would also remind, remind all of you that uh, uh, I have been here at the 92 Street Y before. Uh, it was really kind of the beginning of the end of my illustrious Republican career, uh, my affiliation of record for my entire uh, 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 professional political life. Because I said at the time, I'd just gotten off the campaign trail where we'd run for president, taken third place in New Hampshire and decided that uh, there was no more to give, that we'd kind of had enough, uh, and enjoyed every minute of it. But I came here and I said, the ideological rigidity that exists within my party is not unlike the ideological rigidity that exists within the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you heard about it. And I heard day, about it. Right? And they said, you were, you were hereby disinvited from the next gathering of Republican fundraisers in Florida. So, and I haven't heard since. So, it all started here at the 92 Street Y, I have to And, I have and to remind we will you. get to politics by the end of the evening. We'll do that. Your That'll sense be fun. in 2016. That'll be fun. Uh, uh, Asia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say that uh, what was uh, omitted from the resume was the fact that, that I'm just a failed rock musician. <laughs> that was my trajectory in life in high school. And uh, what instrument? What uh, keyboards? Yeah. So what does a failed rock musician do? Uh, the fallback position naturally is politics, right? So that <laughs> that that got me going somewhat. But I have to take you back to 1971, when my dad worked in the White House for Richard Nixon. It wasn't a happy time, because a lot of shenanigans were happening behind the scenes. My dad was a staff assistant to the President of the United States, kind of a paper mover, yeah. a staff secretary within the White House. He worked there for a year. The only time I got to see my dad, because those jobs are a grind, it's, you know, 24-7, uh, 
was to visit the White House on weekends and to hang out out by what then was a Coke machine and the snack machine. You're too young to remember those days, Nick. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'd see my dad every now and again, but I'd, I'd grow frustrated and bored and you know, occasionally, you know, guys who were later thrown in jail after Watergate would come down the hall and I'd catch a glimpse of them. <laughs> on one occasion, uh, Colonel Alexander Haig came walking down the hallway and said, young man, uh, apparently seeing that I was bored, uh, looking for the Coke machine. Would you like to shake the hand of the National Security Advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger? Oh, okay. I, thought, I thought it was himself. Who's, who's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was moving in that direction, yeah. but not quite there. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know who Henry Kissinger was, and I said, well, well sure, I'm just bored, hang around, 11 years old at the time. <laughs> so he took me in Kissinger's office, uh, shook hands with Dr. Kissinger. Uh, he had a black bag next to his desk. And uh, he said, would you help me carry the bag out to the car, young man? So I grabbed the bag, walked out to West Executive Drive, right out there right by the West, the West Wing, Wing, where you've gone in and out a thousand times yeah. so you're going to the Situation Room. And uh, we got out with a scrum of people there uh, by the black limo. And I said, where are you going, Dr. Kissinger? And he said, young man, it's a state secret. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone, I'm going to China. So was I True there story. at the beginning of- True story. Was I there at the beginning of the U.S.-China relationship? I was there at the beginning that of the U.S.-China relationship. That was, that's a, <laughs> that was, that, that, was, was, that was July of 1971. That's the secret trip. July of 1971. And you kept a secret. And <laughs> it, was, it was fun because uh, uh, I got to carry his bag. Uh, but I told the story to President Obama you know, Republican, you know, being named ambassador to China under a Democrat. And it was interesting because I found, you know, to find yourself on the sofa in the Oval Office, conversing one-on-one -on -one with a president, not of your party. Right. Uh, I had co-chaired, I'd been the national co-chair of John McCain's campaign in 2008 against him, so it was an unusual thing for me to be sitting in the Oval Office. And, and, I, I, and when he put the question to me about going to China, I knew that uh, the answer would have to be yes. Because uh, I thought of my, instinctively, I, I thought of my, my relatives, all of whom fought in a uniform. I thought of my two sons who were both in the United States Navy. And I thought, how can I turn down a president, even somebody not of my party, when you're asked to serve your country? Yeah. And it, it hurt me within my own party, and, and, and I suffered a little bit because of it. But would I do it over again? I, I, absolutely, I'd do it all over again, because it was such a great honor to serve the United States of America. <laughs> But, I, but um, I, told, I told President Obama, after he made the announcement, I told him the Kissinger story. And he laughed, he thought it was funny. He said, I'll bet he carries your bag someday. <laughs> and there was a, a reporter present who wrote something like that up, and it appeared in a paper the next day or so. And who would I see two weeks later? Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger for lunch, <laughs> who was beautifully standing outside the restaurant. And as I walked up, he said, Young man, if there's your bag. <laughs> <laughs> he, of course, so, fully briefed. So were you surprised to be asked by the president? You know, I, uh, I was and I wasn't. Uh, and first of all, let me just take you back to, you know, when I was 19, I was shipped out as a young Mormon missionary. Uh, I wasn't a great proselytizer, so I come from, you know, a family, half of whom were uh, prolific proselytizers, the other half of whom were saloon keepers. Uh, public educators and saloon keepers, I don't know if that goes hand in hand or not, but, uh, and they ran the Huntsman Saloon right in the middle of, of Utah in Fillmore. So named after Millard Fillmore in an attempt to try to get statehood, so they named the, the whole damn town after him, and it still didn't work. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, but in any event, that, that kind of uh, took and, me then and later. where did you go on mission? So I, I went, to proselytizing, well, I gonna, so that half of the family, I went off to Taiwan at 19 years of age, as a lot of young uh, Mormons do, uh, found that I, I, I wasn't a great proselytizer, but I absolutely was totally consumed and enthralled with living in a country 10,000 miles away. I'd never experienced that before, and as a 19-year-old, riding my bicycle around through the alleyways, striking up conversations, trying to learn Chinese, which is where I initially learned it, uh, and seeing the anger in people's faces, because you'll remember, Nick, this was right um, after we cut ties based on the Shanghai community. And normalized our relations. And normalized our relations in 1979. Yeah. Normalized our relations with Beijing. And the anger toward Americans was, uh, was palpable. 
And I thought, while experiencing this, I thought, I had no, first of all, I had no idea that my country exerted that much influence abroad. It just had never dawned on me as a young 19-year-old growing up in the American West. And I thought, when I get home in two years, I want to spend a good part of my life figuring this all out. And if I ever had an opportunity to serve my country in a capacity that would bring the two sides closer, why well, that would be a dream come true. And were you fluent in, uh, in Mandarin by the time you left uh, Taipei? Pretty darn fluent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can't live there virtually uh, off the street. Because back in 1979, Taiwan was a much different place. Very underdeveloped. You know, they still had the, the propaganda signs on the walls to overtake the main, mainland. Uh, Zhang Jingguo, uh, Zhang Kai-shek's son, was running the place. Right. It was under martial law, uh, running it with an iron fist. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, you learn Chinese or you don't survive. Yeah. Uh, and so I learned it, and I, the old flashcards that I'd ride around on my bicycle with, one, one hand on, on the steering wheel and the other memorizing flashcards as I would uh, pedal around. And so I figured I'd memorize maybe 2,000 characters by the end of two years. Then I went back to college and continued my studies in Chinese, and it's been, a, it's been an avocation ever since. And I studied Cantonese for a year while I was in college and picked up a little Taiwanese dialect while I was living in Taiwan. And then went back to live in Taiwan a second time in the mid 80s uh, in business, right when uh, Zhang Jingguo passed. This is your family business? Yeah, it yeah. was our first ever, so we started from zero. We just, you, we had a, one little manufacturing plant. And the first technology license agreement uh, in our co company's history was in Taiwan. So out of college I went over and did the build up uh, of the plant, pre-market of the product, and uh, it just so happened that during that period, Zhang Jingguo passed away. Uh, the rise of Li Donghui, yep. the Taiwan-born uh, vice president, and the ensuing uh, drama when Madame Zhang Kai-shek, at 105 years old or whatever it was, flew from New York to Taipei to try to keep Li Donghui down from getting both the presidency and the head of the Guomindang, uh, the two the two prominent positions. And I was watching all of this, you know, in my mid-20s, thinking this is absolutely amazing. And I, I thought I was a kind of a keen student of Taiwan politics, but living there when Taiwan went from martial law to the rise of this full, fully blossomed almost democracy, freedom of the press, respect for opposition political parties, it was an unbelievable time. So those were the experiences that must have been instrumental in your decision. Absolutely. Not just to absolutely. be in, in business, but to go into public service. And you ran for office, and you ran for governor of Utah. And I should say, I told the governor this when I first met him. I have, one of my older brothers lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. He's been there for 40 years. He's a liberal Democrat. I'll never forget a conversation we said, we have this governor, John Huntsman. He's a Republic, Republican, and Utah is the reddest state in red America, and yet he is supported by all the Democrats. You had bipartisan support, elected twice. How did that happen? You know, I don't now have to explain how, why I did so well in the Iowa caucus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I found that, that as a governor, an interesting thing happens when you're elected governor. You wake up the next morning having run a whole year on a particular platform that you represent everybody. Yeah. You wake up that morning thinking, I don't represent a political party, I represent everybody. And it was such a compelling instinct uh, when I started, and it's an intimidating task because all of a sudden you're number one in the state. People are looking to you to articulate the way forward, develop a strategy, execute, and provide a more hopeful tomorrow. And, and I felt that, uh, that compulsion to do it right and to not let people down. So I brought people in to my cabinet, some of whom worked for my opponent, Scott Matheson, who was a wonderful guy. Yeah. In one of these, one of these elections where you know, it, 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 on election eve, you know, Scott Matheson, whose father had been a great governor of the state of Utah, and he was then dean of the law school at University of Utah, and I was in my election headquarters, and we called each other and said, how this ends doesn't matter, but we're gonna shake each other's hand in public, in front of the cameras, uh, to show that there's more to politics than fistfights. And there's civility. There's civility, and he came over to my campaign headquarters, and we hugged each other in front of the cameras, uh, and I'd won that night. And of course the media, some of the stories coming out were a strange thing happened in Utah tonight. <laughs> uh, the Republican and the Democrat embraced 
uh, on election night, and it's just the way we ran the campaign. We argued, we debated the issues, not about each other. And, and that kind of stimulated me to want to be a, a governor of all of the people and bring people on board who were different backgrounds, because I knew the best ideas for education, for land use, for the environment, for job growth, were not in any one camp, but would be a combination of, of the best thinking on both sides. And that's what we did. And, and I put that to the test, ran for re-election. Not that uh, I'm a good politician, I'm not a good politician. But we got 80% of the vote for re-election. I got more Democrats voting for me that's, than my Democratic opponent. That's pretty impressive. And, and, it was, and that's, after that, I got the call from President Obama and, uh, and, and the call to go to China. And to that executive authority, it's interesting to look at, I'll just say this, because the governor can't say this. I look at the Republican debates. I see all those people up there very few with executive experience in governance, whether at the state level or the national level. Was that important for you when you went out to be ambassador? And could you relate to some of the Chinese leaders maybe better, and they to you, because you'd actually run a state? Well, I think they looked at me a little differently when I went out as ambassador. Uh, so I, I could connect immediately with the provincial governors. <clears throat> I could connect with somebody like Xi Jinping, who was then vice president, because he'd been a provincial governor in Zhejiang and in yeah. Fujian. And then he'd been the party secretary in Shanghai before going on and becoming vice president, now head of the party uh, and president. Uh, and so I was seen a little differently in that I, probably the first, second, I guess Jim Sasser was the first elected official to go to China. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oddity in the diplomatic corps, as you know. Uh, but they also, I think, relied on me more to try to explain the inexplicable, which is what's happening in America? How does that system of yours work? Uh, and so it, it provided some unique openings for me as a diplomat. So you talked about Xi Jinping. We were, uh, Governor and I were talking before. I think most China watchers believe he's the most powerful Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping. Uh, he has this unique uh, background. His father was one of the founding members of the Communist Party on the long march with Mao. His wife, his wife's family had a relationship with the military. He did as well. Uh, when did you first meet him? What did you think of him? And what do you think of him now as this very assertive Chinese leader, quite different than Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin? The sense that you get of Xi Jinping, who represents now the fifth generation, so we've had Mao Zedong, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and now Xi Jinping, uh, represents a, a cadre of professionals, mostly in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s, who were so unlike the generation that I saw. So my first trip to China, I lived in Taiwan, but my first trip to China was with Ronald Reagan when I worked as a young advance person on his staff. And, uh, and so saw Deng Xiaoping and Li Shenian and Bo Weibo and, uh, and uh, uh, all the early- this President Reagan's first term. His first term, so yeah. when he went over there in 1983. Uh, and uh, so I was comparing it and contrasting the Mao jackets, lack of English language, lack of any formal education, lack of exposure to the rest of the world, to what I saw with the rise of the fifth generation with Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, and the people who round out the Standing Committee, the Politburo, and the almost 300-member Central Committee. This, you just named the President, the, the, the pr Prime Minister, right. and the, the people who run China. The Suits, yeah. English, yeah. Uh, degrees from the finest schools in the world. An ability I found, it didn't matter which minister I happened to be visiting, an ability to read the United States in a way that I found to be uh, it advanced and, and, uh, and, and nuanced. And all the while, I try to think, now where is the corollary to this in the United States government? Which offices can you walk in and find somebody who understands China as well as they understand us? It's a deep and a sophisticated reading and understanding they have of us. And I was always blown away after those meetings at the way they could assess, analyze, and read our system and our policy initiatives. Uh, I mean, I've gone to brief the China caucus on Capitol Hill. I've talked practically to every cabinet member in, of the last few years. We don't have anybody who understands China in any deep or nuanced way. We don't have any linguists. We don't have people You're who- You're talking about inside the U.S. government. Inside the U.S. government, yeah. At, Congress at and the executive level, branch. At a senior level, yeah. we, we just don't have anybody. Yet they're developing a generation now under Xi Jinping of pretty sophisticated technocrats not bureaucrats, but technocrats. And, and it leads me to say that, and this is where I do agree with Donald Trump, that at the negotiating table, 
you know, we're going to have our lunch eaten just from a human capacity standpoint if we can't put forward people who actually understand the subject matter and are adroit uh, and, uh, and sophisticated about culture, language, history, uh, politics, uh, and the way that the fifth generation operates. So you, you don't have to spend a lot of time around Xi Jinping uh, without realizing that, A, he comes from pretty good political stock. So his father, Xi Jinping, uh, was a former deputy premier, uh, railroaded out during the Cultural Revolution, imprisoned uh, during the Mao years, as was his mother. Uh, and Xi Jinping was sent uh, to Shanxi, which is a little bit like being sent to when Wyoming. When he was a teenager during the Cultural Revolution, yes. so the late 1960s. So 66 to 76. Yeah. So let's just say that, so he's, he turned 63 last June. Uh, let's just say that he lived to see the most brutal years of modern Chinese history. The, the Great Leap Forward, 1960 to 1964, mm -hmm. uh, and then the Cultural Revolution, 66 to 76, and certainly the Tiananmen Square period. Uh, so what I, uh, what's in his head when he arrives at uh, the Renmin Da Hui Tang, the Great Hall of the People every day? He's thinking, I have seen China at its most chaotic, and I don't want to see it again. So stability. Stability. So when people are searching for what are China's intentions and what does it want, it's assertive, yes, in ways that it hasn't been, perhaps any time in its recent history. Uh, it has newfound confidence on the world stage based upon its economic throw weight. But more than anything, Xi Jinping shows up at the office and says, I pray for a benign external environment and a peaceful domestic environment. Because my whole thing is I've got to grow the economy in ways that ensure jobs and forward motion. Because if I can't grow at a certain rate per year, I get unemployment, and high unemployment results in political instability for me. And I can't afford that. That'll topple the, the regime, because they have no alternative governing system, and it will, it will be the end of modern China. So that's the overarching objective of the Chinese leadership. They're still building China after yep. the ravages of the last two centuries. Right. So John, they grew between the late 70s, Deng Xiaoping's assumption of power, and very recently, the fastest recorded growth rate in recorded economic history worldwide is China, the last 30 years. If they dip from 10% growth rates, they say they're at 7%. They may be below 7%, honestly. If they go to 6%, what does it mean for stability of all those young men coming from the provinces in the greatest rural to urban migration rate in history don't have jobs? Is that part of the Achilles heel uh, of China well, going forward? Part, part of the challenge is uh, the move from the old to the new, uh, what it's doing to agriculture. So it was really interesting to sit in President Obama's first meeting with Wen Jiabao, then the premier, the number two guy to Hu Jintao, who preceded Xi Jinping. And it was President Obama's first trip to China, and I was there as ambassador, you know. This is 2000 and... This would have been 2010. 10. Yeah, 9 or 10. And we teed him up as the first Pacific president. Uh, you know, Herbert Hoover had actually lived in China before, but, you know, he, he wasn't born and raised in, 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 in Asia, yeah. as in Hawaii being part of Asia, or had yeah. lived in, in Indonesia. So we got there, and people were terribly curious about this new president. And he sat down with one job out, the premier. Got over all the, we got health care problems, we've got this problem, we've got jobs, we're pulling out of a very, very deep recession. And one job out stopped him in his tracks. Was, you've been in these meetings a thousand times, a small group, you know, maybe three and three or four and four. And one job out said, uh, how would you like to have this as a problem, Mr. President? He said, how would you like to be a country of 800 million farmers? Becoming a country of 200 million farmers. He said, I have 600 million redundant farmers on my hands, and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> That'll stop you in your tracks in terms of the challenge. So you talk about this term urbanization, uh, which is very real in China, uh, and looking at the old hukou system, the way they managed uh, the, old, uh, the old work permit program, where you lived, where you buy your goods, uh, where you would work, and it had everything to do with labor mobility, how to take the old hukou system and make it uh, more than just a, an alleyway or a district-wide hukou, city, county, regional, so that they can free up the workforce. What's happening is they've got more people leaving the, the marketplace than entering the marketplace because they're an aging society. 
And all the while, they've got people moving from the Sichuans and the Qinghais and the Gansus of the world, sort of the, the, center, per, the center parts of the country, into the city centers. And uh, a massive in-migration. So you've got cities like Tianjin and Beijing and Shanghai and, and Fujian that are 20 million today, going on 40 million tomorrow. And there was one article in uh, the Times recently suggesting that the Chinese were looking at Beijing as 150 or so million people. So when you connect Tianjin and Beijing and some of the going down to Shijiazhuang uh, and maybe inward a little bit, you know, 150 million people, all in one contiguous unit. I mean, what do you do about jobs, about transportation, air quality? We wake up, you know, last week, Shenyang, which is an industrial city up in, up in Liaoning, up by North Korea, where we have a consulate. PM 2.5, 1,400. And what's normal? 25. Right. And our embassy, your embassy, was actually monitoring air quality yes. and publish it, publishing it because the Chinese people weren't getting that kind of information. Yes, and I, I got hauled in many times on that. By the Chinese government? Yes. Did you? Yeah. So we put a, a little gadget on, on top of the embassy with a lot of other fancy gadgets. And, and so we'd, <laughs> Which we'd, we won't talk about. <laughs> we won't talk about. <laughs> we may have bought them from one of your old embassies. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and, and we'd pick up, you know, the air quality reading uh, based on EPA standards, PM2.0, and then we tweet it out. And, and it got a huge following. You know, the, the people are passionate about air quality in China. They, it's become a hot political issue. That's why the Chinese government is now dealing with it from a policy standpoint. But I'd get called in every now and again saying, Mr. Ambassador, your numbers are wrong. You're out there by the third ring road and you're getting more tailpipe emissions than you would typically get somewhere else in town. Here are the real numbers. Okay, we, we continue to do our thing and they continue to call me in and complain. What are they doing now? They've embraced EPA standards for air quality. That tells you uh, how much this has become a leading political issue in China right now. So, and they're investing in renewables more than anybody else in solar and wind. So they're in this authoritarian society where the party rules, they're feeling pressure from the people yes. on the environment. They're feeling pressure from the people on a number of fronts. You know, imagine 700 million internet users. There's a great wall, but you can talk to my daughters and they can tell you how long it took them to jump the great wall. You know, American teenagers. And, and everybody through VPN technology, they can figure out a way to get around it and access the outside world. China, the government tries to block this or block that, but you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You just can't. Uh, and try as they may, it's not having 100% impact anywhere uh, in the country. And people are taking, some blogs, I remember we had a dinner for the leading bloggers in China one night. Some of the eight folks around the table, some of them had readerships of 100 million blogs. And they're driving a conversation that just years ago would have landed anybody in prison. And I know the, the authorities don't like it and they're trying to shut it down and they're being very heavy handed as they are sometimes. Nothing can do about it. The people are speaking out on these issues and the air quality thing would not be sort of the issue it is, so you heard Li Keqiang at the 18th Party Congress stand up and hold a press conference. He said, I'm the action officer, I'm the responsible, I'm gonna fix it. The current prime minister. The current premier, of China. and he hasn't fixed it. Yeah. And now they're releasing the 13th five-year plan. We just had a couple of weeks ago, the fifth plenum of the 18th Party Congress. We're en route to the 19th Party Congress in 2017. And you better believe that part of the five-year plan, 13th five-year plan will be uh, emissions, uh, pollution control technology, it's a very real issue and people are hopping mad about it. And uh, they're taken out against the government. So we look back on China since Deng Xiaoping's time when we normalized with Jimmy Carter. Um, this is an extraordinary record of achievement to lift several hundred million people out of poverty, to modernize the country. I mean, when you visit China, I'm sure most people here, many people have visited China to see these beautiful airports, first rate infrastructure, high speed trains, and yet, they're now trying to, they've been a, a massive export economy. They're trying to make a big transition in their economy for an export led to a consumption driven economy. This is gonna be a big challenge. How do you see them weathering that challenge? This, this is historic, this economic transformation. So it's almost two transformations that are going on. It's kind of the end of dynasty in that the Deng Xiaoping dynasty is now over. Uh, uh, because Deng Xiaoping didn't anoint Xi Jinping. He did up to Hu Jintao, but he didn't Xi Jinping. So you really have the end of the Deng legacy, which is marked by A, maintaining the opening to the world, B, uh, open economic policies with the rest of the world, and C, primacy of the party. 
what is the party? You know, it's 85 million members, active in about 3,500 outposts around the country. You still can't get anything done in the country without the, the party. So that's the end of the Deng legacy, and now you've got the incoming Xi Jinping legacy, and, uh, and a fundamentally a different, a different look at how business is transacted in the country. So you're confident they can make that transition? Well, here's the problem. So they're unplugging themselves from the investment-fueled export model, which has served them for 30 years. And you know, I guess any developing country with a large population can do it, and many have. You discount your currency, you draw from cheap labor, uh, cheap raw materials, and you export to the major markets of the world. And they have, with reckless abandon for 30 years, racked up a foreign exchange reserves of almost $4 trillion, probably in today's world, maybe $3.5 trillion. And they've reached the middle income trap, where they can keep doing it, but real wages aren't rising. And moreover, they've got a labor problem, in that labor rates are going up. People are thinking about, oh, I think I'll go to India. Or I think, everyone's here saying, I think I'll, I'll go to China. In China, they're saying, I think we'll go to Vietnam or I think we'll go to Bangladesh or India. They've got the same problem there. So they say, what to do? We've got to keep wages moving up. We've got to disconnect ourselves from this investment-led export model and move more toward a consumption model. And they're, I, I would liken it to the journey from point A to point B. They're somewhere in the middle with a tremendous amount of uncertainty around their journey uh, because there's no template to guide them. There's no guarantee that you get to the promised land. And therefore, the markets have been terribly shaky about the journey. Growth numbers have been well below what people thought they would be. Uh, their currency has, of course, been manipulated in ways to stimulate further growth. Right. And we've seen trillions of dollars in, in traditional subsidies uh, over the last many years. In recent years, more targeted subsidies. So, but their eye is on the ball. And Xi Jinping, uh, to his credit, he has a strategy. And his team has a strategy. And they know where they're going. And on the economic side, they're not looking back. Uh, and uh, his challenge is this, he has to convince skeptical people, you know, people are skeptical in China just like they're skeptical here. They have a trust deficit that I would liken as being similar to our trust deficit. They don't trust the government. The people to the government, yeah. People in the party, uh, no transparency, we can't participate. Uh, and that's getting to be a significant issue, I would have to say, in China, the trust deficit. They like Xi Jinping, so as I do the Taxi cab test. So as I can speak Chinese, I, I'll jump in taxi cabs in different towns and I'll talk to the drivers. What do you think about Xi Jinping? And I have yet to find one who doesn't like Xi Jinping. They all think he's on their side because of the anti corruption campaign that has taken a lot of the high flyers out and, uh, and punishing them. Uh, so that, that, you know, that, so you've got the economic transition underway, you've got the political transition, but his challenge is really one of communication. How do you develop, communicate, and maintain a message of confidence and light at the end of the tunnel, where now it's time for the average citizen of the country to take out their enormous savings, and the saving rate in China is probably 35%, complete opposite of what we have here. Mm -hmm. Time to take out your run mean B from under the mattress and invest it into the future of the country. Where when you look back at least to 1840, let's say the first opium war, 1842, every 20 or 40 years is a massive upheaval, incursion, revolution. You know, the, the, the Opium Wars, the Taiping Rebellion, the Boxer Rebellion, the end of the Qing Dynasty, 19, 1911, 1912, the rise of the party in 1922, invasion by Japan, 1932, World War II, the Civil War, 45 to 49, liberation, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen Square, people are saying, I'm not sure that I can trust what So 180 say. years of instability. So people safe. Well, the challenge for Xi is he has to convince them that we're stable, we've got a plan, and you can now invest in your future. You don't have to hoard your savings. Right. And unless he can convince his people to break the savings loose to invest in their future, the consumption model pretty much dies, or at least it's unsuccessful. He's got to bet on people participating directly in their economy, becoming more entrepreneurial, more innovative, keeping more commerce there in the country, and that's where I think ultimately this plan for it to work, ultimately he's going to have to get to respecting intellectual property rights because it's his own technology that you'll be looking at. He'll have to get to some semblance of rule of law or something that 
resemble certainty within the commercial marketplace. Business adjudication, rules of the road, you just can't keep going as you are and expect for domestic business to flourish beyond a certain level. So I know there are a lot of skeptics uh, out there, but I would have to say that if I had to forecast his second term from 2017 to the 20th Party Congress in 2022 when he'll step down and retire, I think a lot of that last term is gonna be focused on really driving home the elements of economic reform that lead to the foundation that will be needed for more domestic enterprise, more innovation, more entrepreneurship. So I wanna talk about US-China relations, obviously. I also wanna talk about the Silk Road, but one key question before we get to that. When you re read analyses of China's future, experts always ask a, a final question. Will the Communist Party of China remain predominant 10, 20, 30 years from now, or at some point, do the Chinese people, now connected, several hundred thousand students in the United States alone, connected with the rest of the world, they understand how the rest of the world lives, are they gonna to wanna to live, live in a society where human rights, religious rights, civil rights, pretty much denied, the kind of rights that we enjoy here? How long can the party retain that kind of oppressive dominance over the Chinese There's people? no way the current system could be maintained. Uh, it will have to change. I'm not talking about a Jeffersonian democracy. A lot of us make the mistake of saying there'll be a Jeffersonian democracy. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting the change will probably come about in longer increments than we with attention deficit disorder in the West are willing to provide. But something that maybe looks like Singapore in its earlier days after independence in 1965 under the People's Action Party, yeah. which grew up, had to open up, had to embrace uh, a diverse population, uh, had to provide jobs and economic certainty. Not a Jeffersonian democracy. Yeah. But still. Yeah. A had its challenges, was but it was pretty much a dominant one party. And, you know, today the People's Action Party controls, I don't know, 70 of the 75 seats in Singapore. Uh, it runs. It runs. Uh, and freedom for the most part for people, successful economy. I, if I had to guess, China over the next 50 years will look probably more like an open party, single party, as opposed to two competing parties but an open party that functions more like the People's Action Party you see in, in Singapore than, than a two-party system would be my guess. But closed as it is today, not granting basic rights to people who increasingly will demand it, uh, and vociferously so, I, I just think is totally unsustainable. And I'm guessing if you were to corner Xi Jinping in the Great Hall of the People, that he would probably say, I have to somehow, even though it looks like the assertiveness and the belligerence short term, is, uh, is a little Maoist. Uh, I have to get to the point in 2022 when I leave the stage of having opened up a few things, created or planted some seeds for civil society, which I suspect by that point we'll see some evidence of. Non-governmental institutions. Right. Civic institutions. Right. That we have an abundance here that we have an abundance. people together. We have an abundance, and I just think that's unavoidable. You, you can't stop that from happening, but probably not a Jeffersonian democracy. So we've talked about Xi Jinping and what a powerful leader he is inside China um, with the anti-corruption drive and with his personal standing. He's also extraordinarily ambitious about China and the world. Um, you and I talked last week about the Silk Road Project, China building high-speed rail, infrastructure, pipelines horizontally between Central Asia, yeah. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan to China, yeah. vertical pipelines from Pakistan into Western China. Um, awesome ambition of the kind of infrastructure development that we saw mm. in the latter part of the 19th century, mm. early part of the 20th century in the United States. Um, how big a part of his legacy is this? How is it important to China's global standing that it complete this project? This is central. Pursue it. The, 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 the Silk Road. Silk the, Road. As you call it, the Idai Lu, the One Belt, One Road. Yeah. Because why is it important? Because it has an economic component sort of raising standards in the neighborhood, in Central Asia, South Asia, and beyond, and it has a political component. It gets them further uh, uh, respect on the world stage. Uh, and it has a further sort of global order component in that Xi Jinping does not like the current order, which is a very US-centric order. We have written the rules of the road for the most part since 1945. Uh, and he'd like to write some rules of the road. Uh, and he'd like to have new institutions like the Asian uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank that go by different rules. So this is also an attempt to carve out uh, a different global order. A role for China. That has a distinct role for China to play. 
So he's banking heavily on this Silk Road concept. He floated it in initially in the third plenum right after the, uh, the 18th Party Congress, which would have been in 2013. And then he went to Kazakhstan and gave further definition, and then to Indonesia uh, later that year to kind of build on that theme. And then it was pretty much rolled out in detail by the NDRC, uh, kind of the central planning body, uh, earlier this year. And it's a, a, an unbelievably ambitious concept. And it's got Xi Jinping written all over it. So does he chair the small group that will drive this thing? No question about it. And it's a long game shot if ever there was one. I mean, what I wish we could think in long-term increments. I'd give anything if we the could way the Chinese do. find a goal, uh, find a goal, stick to it, and deliver. You know, there's so many goals in this country that would be nice to kind of focus in on, whether education or infrastructure or some other things. This is a long-term goal. And you already see, you know, you, you mentioned it, rail, roads, pipelines. So imagine that whole link from Xi'an, which is in central China, all the way through to Moscow, and then down to Istanbul, and ultimately to Europe. And these are energy connections? They're energy connections, connections, transportation links, and all the while you're putting people to work, and yeah. guess what? There are enormous inventories that have been built up with the horrible imbalances in China. Boy, they can, they can start moving that stuff too. So there are a number of levels at which this works out perfectly well for Xi Jinping. And then you go south through, let's just say, you know, uh, Pakistan, where they're putting 56 billion bucks into it, rebuilding the port of Karachi, rebuilding the port of Colombo in Sri Lanka. And the port of Gwadar. On and and you, can, yeah, you can see then, and that's the southern route, and that ultimately takes you to the Middle East and Africa. So you've got the northern route, you've got the southern route, and all the while they're picking up friends, because the money is a little bit like a narcotic. It, it feels really good at the beginning, and then you get sick later on. And I think that the challenge or the risk here is going to be that there's a little bit of a blowback from the heavy-handedness. It all sounds good and looks good and might even create jobs temporarily, but then you might have some longer-term problems about the nationals resenting the fact that so much of it is owned by China, controlled by China, evidenced by China's involvement, let's just say in Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, over the last 20, 25 years, where a lot of projects have, have gone in, or Africa, where there's beginning to become a, a little bit of that blowback. And so I think China's gonna have to watch the speed with which they go, the diplomacy involved, and the step-by-step build-out but it's terribly ambitious. And it's also tied, by the way, to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And I want to ask you about this, because 10 years ago, when I was Under Secretary of State, we were frustrated. I think both President Clinton and President George W. Bush, that China didn't appear to be playing a vigorous role in the world. It tended to be focused on China. So the Bush administration said, we want China to be um, a stakeholder, responsible a stakeholder. responsible yeah. stakeholder. Here comes China this past year as a responsible stakeholder, yeah. holder, I think. We're going to create this investment bank. We're going to pump billions of dollars into the economies of other countries. And the United States government opposed it because yeah. it wasn't our idea, because yeah. we weren't sharing it. Us. Was that a mistake? Huge mistake. Even our friends and allies have since said, uh, we're going in. <laughs> you can stay out, but, right. but we're going in. It would have been uh, hard to, to imagine Congress appropriating some paid-in capital. So the capital structure of the AIIB is pretty much like the World Bank. Uh, every country contributing their, their, their percentage. It would have been inconceivable to think that Congress would have voted for it. But that's okay. We could have uh, arranged uh, observer status or something else to help shape the direction of this very important body. Because it's inexorably tied from a development finance standpoint to the Idai Lu. To the, to the Silk Road. So what you're saying is, John, that we have to, we're still the strongest power in the world by any metric, economic weight, military power, political influence. And we will be, I think, the United States for the next 40 or 50 years. But China is occupying a bigger space. And we have these multiple global challenges like climate change, international trafficking of people, drugs. We need China to help us battle those problems. You know, transnational And issues. need to make space for China, right? No question about it. You mentioned the transnational issues. It's, yeah. it's hard to imagine the United States solving all of these without the participation of another major world leader. And like it or not, we're gonna to have to have a balance sheet going forward that says, okay, here are the issues that we don't agree on, that are really tough, 
and we yell and scream at each other in the bilateral meetings, we're gonna put those here and develop strategies to, to, to build confidence in a solution. And over here, we're gonna have issues that are less transactional, but maybe based on shared values, common values. And transnational issues are common values. You just mentioned some of them. Mm -hmm. And you can build out a whole relationship around the common values side of the balance sheet. And we have to be smart enough as a country to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And we just haven't proven an ability to do that in a very, very long time. To manage the difficult issues, uh, which include our values as well, that we're just not gonna back up on. They include human rights and freedom of navigation and things like that. And then to deal with uh, uh, the, the more glo global agenda that uh, the United States and China are just gonna have to coordinate uh, on a little more effectively. They wanna do it and we should wanna do it and together we can get to a solution to these problems that much faster. So we've, we've, ten, we've thought since the end of the Second World War of Britain, France, Germany, Japan as our, the group of countries we work with to manage the international system. China needs to join that group. India needs to join that group. Brazil needs to join it. But China's primus inter pares among the rising powers. I've talked to my class about this at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And I invited Ambassador Steve Bosworth, whom you know. Steve Bosworth was right. President Obama's North Korea negotiator. He was our ambassador to the Philippines. We were together in the Six Party Talks. That's right. Yeah. And we were talking about this issue that you just mentioned, that China is gonna be our most important partner for the next half century on issues that we really care about, climate change, the fate of the global economy, fighting um, pandemics around the world, like the Ebola crisis last year. And yet at the same time, and we'll get to this, we're gonna be competing with China for global military power in Asia. And Ambassador Bosworth said to my class, he thought that tricky, complex balance, he said, it'll be the most difficult thing the American people have ever done. And I stopped him and said, Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War II, he said, this could be, he said, the most difficult balancing act we've ever had in American foreign policy in 240 years. What because do you think? the stakes are enormously high. I, I completely agree. But to begin the journey, we have to frame the conversation here at home. You can imagine on a debate stage, either Republican or Democrat, this season, somebody referring to China as a partner. They'd get booed right off the stage. So how do you have a rational conversation about this, the most important relationship of the 21st century, without getting booed off of a political stage, but being able to talk about it in ways where you can inform the American people about the stakes, the strategy, how we get from point A to point B, in ways that bring people along as opposed to make it a political divide. We're not having conversations in this country about how to deal with the most important relationship of the 21st century. Which it is. They're playing the long game and we are playing the short game and I think we're gonna be discounted as a result of it. Okay, so we've got that balancing act. Part of it is gonna be the fact that the United States has been the predominant military power since the close of the Second World War in Asia. We have treaty allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia. We have defense agreements with the Philippines and Thailand. We have new security partners, Vietnam, India. Hard to believe. Do the Chinese see this? the USS John McCain pulling into, <laughs> well, pulling into port in Vietnam. Right, and the, exactly right. And the, and the US carrier battle groups kind of the policeman on the beat, keeping the shipping lanes open for commercial traffic. The Chinese, as I see it, under Xi Jinping, are beginning to push out into that space that we've occupied for 70 years as the predominant power. In the South China Sea, in the Spratly and Paracel Islands, China's contesting the sovereignty of five other states. In the East China Sea, contesting the sovereignty of Japan, the Senkaku Dayu Islands. Mm -hmm. um, the United States Navy, sent a destroyer, the USS Lawson, through the South China Sea last week to say, in what we believe are international waters, to contest China's claim of sovereignty. Is this the right thing to do? Should we be doing more of it? And can we do this without provoking some kind of conflict with China? This is where it gets a little tricky. <clears throat> you, you have to stop to say that th this is a core American value, that of protecting the global common. Right. If we can't claim that as a major American value from a security and a foreign policy standpoint, we're not good for much of anything else. I mean, that's just absolutely critical and essential for the flow of commerce, for peace and stability, and for all the other work that goes on uh, in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. I would, I would say that the South China Sea's 
a more complicated animal than the East China Sea I because agree. it's a bilateral dispute with Japan yeah. over Senkaku Diaoyu. Uh, Korea is in there to a lesser extent, but that's a bilateral thing that will have to be worked out over time. And I'm not, given uh, how each capital is trying to capitalize, both Shinzo Abe and Xi Jinping, uh, on this feud, no, nobody wants to give it up because Shinzo Abe scores so many points yeah, in Japanese Tokyo. Japanese Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just imagine this, so, you know, Shinzo Abe uh, is the grandson of Nobusuke Kishi, and Xi Jinping is the son of Xi Jinping. Uh, Nobusuke Kishi helped to manage Manchukuo in the 1930s. Ja Japan occupied uh, Manchuria. Uh, Manchuria. Uh, and so, she, when Xi Jinping looks across at, uh, at uh, Shinzo Abe, he doesn't just see a prime minister. There's family, there's history, it goes very, very deep. So, it's, uh, so let's just say that's a different kind of dispute that will probably be around for a while. The South China Sea, on the other hand, you know, goes back at least as far as, uh, as uh, the, the Sino-French uh, uh, days, uh, the early 1800s, and probably before that. Uh, when, French, when the French sort of dominated uh, Indochina. Uh, and you've got now five claimants uh, in a very complicated mix of islands uh, in the Spratly and, and Paracel chains, you know, 200 islands or uh, atolls that barely poke above the water. I mean, it's, it's interesting what one might consider an island. Uh, and so it's important because if you can claim one of those islands, you get, you know, your special economic zone, which can be kind of a 200, 50 to 300 mile buffer. And if you can get enough of these concentric circles, uh, you can pretty much dominate the whole, the whole South China Sea uh, in terms of navigation and during a time of war from a military standpoint. So complicated further by the relationship we had with Chiang Kai-shek in 1947, where instead of the nine dash line, which goes down through the Gulf of Tonkin. This is China's Vietnam. claim to the South China China's Sea. claim to the South China Sea, which is a whole thing, yeah. and up around Indonesia, up by Philippines, uh, and up just below Taiwan. Uh, it was, a, it was a, an 11-dash line back under Chiang Kai-shek, and moreover, we recognized his claim, Chiang Kai-shek, under the National's government days. And so you sit in meetings with, with the Chinese today, and they say, what gives? You used to support this, uh, this whole claim to sovereignty. How did you answer the question? Well, that's, <laughs> I'd answer in Chinese, so I'm not going to tell you what, how I answer <laughs> it. Uh, let's just say as a diplomat, you're supposed to say nothing when there's something to say, yeah. and something when there's nothing to say. Uh, <laughs> so, so the trick is going to be, how do you take the claimants who are all piled onto each other by virtue of geography, history, sovereignty, uh, wars, uh, uh, incursions, battles, uh, uh, occupation. You've got Philippines, you've got Brunei, you have Malaysia, you have Vietnam, you have China, and Taiwan and is Taiwan. In, there, in, there, yeah. in there as well. Because it deals with sovereignty, that which is most sacrosanct in foreign policy, there's no way you're going to convince anybody to give up. No way. And the uh, Southeast Asians, four of the five I just mentioned, uh, part of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, a collective security group that came together in 67, 68. They're saying, please, United States, help resolve this thing. S keep your navy here. Keep, keep the Seventh Fleet. Yeah. <laughs> the Chinese are trying to negotiate on a one-off bilateral basis in, with us, and we don't stand a chance. Please provide a backstop, at least uh, uh, adjudicate to some extent, create a, a fair environment for us to uh, ne negotiate uh, in a regional multilateral context, maybe using the ASEAN framework to come up with a code of conduct that then prescribes what you do for fishing, for drilling, for military exercises, for transportation. And that at least will be a holding pattern for a while so that war doesn't break out. And I suspect that that's going to be the short-term solution is that code of conduct and then getting people to respect that code of conduct. The Chinese, on the other hand, hate the, the Americans playing that role. They don't want us anywhere near. They say, you're butting in again, this is not any of uh, your business, and let us deal with it. The collateral damage, then, is that you've got ASEAN running to the United States with open arms, like I've never seen them before. And we have a defense agreement with the Philippines. We do, and we have a pretty, when I was U.S. Ambassador to Singapore in the early 90s, we took command logistics to Western Pacific from Manila when the Philippine Senate, by one vote, kicked us out, kicked us out. Subic and Clark. And we took Comlog Westpac and moved it to Singapore. They gave us an old Australian base and said, if you want to come here, make sure there are no troops. 
We'll give you gas, we'll give you food, we'll let you park, and just so long as you keep the sea lanes open, that's all we want. And, uh, and the Singaporeans have been a, a pretty good partner in, in that sense. But it, so we have an opening for a more aggressive, ambitious diplomatic strategy with our friends, partners, and allies in, in Asia, if we wanted to pursue that. Because they're saying, we need more of you, we need friendships, we need our defense uh, agreements enhanced. Uh, so I would say that there's an opening for the United States. The Chinese know that they've overstepped their, their welcome a little bit, and they're trying to deliberate in Beijing to figure out how they can win back some of those relationships in, in ASEAN. And so what President Obama and Secretary Ash Carter ordered last week, which is a freedom of navigation exercise, an American destroyer sails through international waters to prove that we have a right to, right. to do that, to keep those sea lanes open so that China doesn't gain by nine-tenths possession and therefore the right to think they can kick people out. We should continue to do that. We should oh, do it uh, constantly, listen, both air we, and sea. We should not even announce what we're doing. We should just do it. Uh, it's, uh, it's what the Seventh Fleet should be engaging in. These are freedom of navigation exercises. They've happened routinely. And I think we make a miscalculation by making it public, actually. As we I did. Think we back the Chinese into a corner. They have to respond belligerently, because this is against their interests. And it suggests the United States is going to do this infrequently, and we're always going to uh, you know, pre-shadow it with a public announcement. We ought to be doing it routinely. Seventh Fleet ships and our air assets as well through the ADIZ. And I suspect we're doing it more than is being reported. And this is the way that we're going to coexist in a very hot region for some years to come because there is no immediate solution out there. It's going to be a long-term solution. And as I mentioned to you, I think before, uh, Nick, I think that getting the maritime leading nations of the world together to problem solve around the South China Sea, some are in Europe, some are in South America, some in the Middle East, some in Africa. Some uh, yeah, in the Arctic. To, to come up with yeah. a new template. Because yep. uh, the only way you're going to resolve this is to move from sort of the grievances that have been built up over 200 years and to create a, a, a new future. And none of the claimants are going to like it, but I think the international community, based on the, or led by the maritime leading nations of the world, are going to have to sit down and create a new template for how you deal in that mar tricky maritime environment. And the Law of the Seas Treaty, we might want to think about ratifying, because we're discounted a little bit in that we're reading from different sheets of music right now. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1972, supported by every American president, Republican and Democrat, and the U.S. Senate yep. does not ratify it. And this codifies international laws That's pertaining right. to sovereignty. Where are the borders? Uh, that we that can't would be step get, number one. That would be the template that we We can't have. get this through the Senate, mainly because yeah. of Republican uh, objections. My friends. <laughs> All right, so we have questions from the audience, but there's one big question I've got to ask based on what you've just said. Um, the Chinese Navy is becoming a blue water Navy. The Chinese are developing very sophisticated, powerful ballistic missiles. Um, a lot of people fear. They're trying to push the American carrier battle groups uh, out past the first island chain mm -hmm. uh, in the Pacific to Guam and perhaps past, that they want to push us out of being a naval and air power in the Pacific. War with China is unthinkable, catastrophic, insane. How do you maintain your position and not get into a shooting war? Well, it means we're going to have to communicate better. We're going to have to develop more joint exercises. And we're going to have to determine just how aggressive we want to be within that first island chain. So right now, we fly pretty aggressive missions uh, on the reconnaissance side. International airspace. International airspace. And the US ambassadors called in pretty routinely and beat up about, about that. And we say we're an international. If you want to fly off California like the Russians did during the Cold War, be my guest. Right. Uh, but we do it, obviously, for national security reasons. Uh, and we're on, uh, we're on, uh, on the sea uh, in pretty close proximity. If most Americans knew what we did on the doorstep of China, uh, I think they'd feel a little differently about uh, the whole security arrangement, because we have a pretty good buildup of assets uh, in, the, in the area there. Uh, and in, uh, the Chinese are getting better at maritime. So if you look at their defense budget, they're spending probably, uh, probably 150 billion bucks a year against our 500 billion bucks a year. And a lot of their spending is going to maritime capabilities, so their ships are a whole lot better. Their submarines are excellent. They're not buying from the 
the, the Russians anymore. They're building their own, and they're firing sophisticated missiles, missiles 100 feet uh, uh, underwater, which takes a, a real capable group of scientists to get a three-stager uh, out of a submarine through the water and then out in, a, in an intercontinental basis. And they've tested this one for a long, long time. Uh, so they've got that capability, and their, and their weapon systems, as in their missile systems, the DF, the Dongfang 31s, uh, are very, very good. Uh, Road-based systems, land-based systems, sub, increasingly their sub-platforms, they're all getting very, very good. And, and what's to make us think that they, if they had money, they wouldn't spend on these things? Of course they're going to do that. So we fly and we sail just outside Chinese territorial uh, airspace and territorial waters in the South China Sea. And when President Obama visited Alaska in August, yeah. five Chinese naval vessels appeared just outside of American yeah. territorial waters in the Bering Sea <laughs> yeah. off yeah. Alaska, just yeah. to show us we're capable too. Sure. Right. We'll Absolutely. play this game too. That was so Chinese. That was, I, I read about that <laughs> and I thought, I know exactly what was going through so, their heads in Beijing. So I wanted to ask you about politics, and the first question is about politics. Oh, no. Presidential, here's the question. Presidential candidates often present some of the most extreme and dis distorted views on China, yet such talks never went be go beyond the election campaign, let alone being adopted as policies by elected presidents. So um, is this a problem? The fact that during our political campaigns, we bash foreign countries like China. Yeah. And the first day the president takes office, he's got to deal with China. Is yeah. that happening? Is it going to happen in this election? This, this is a really good question. And I, I thought about this a lot as you go back to, you know, at least to the election of 1980, where, where Reagan took on Jimmy Carter for sending our ambassador from ta Taipei to Beijing yeah. and, uh, and had really harsh words saying he was going to take our ambassador out of Beijing back to Taipei. Right. I mean, those are fighting words. He was elected president. You see the world for what it is. Even back then with China with a much smaller footprint, uh, he ended up going to China. I was on that trip, so I saw it. And it was really amazing as a young 20-year-old, you know, 23-year-old uh, to watch play out. Meeting Deng Xiaoping. I mean, these two guys came together. It was, it was I mean, I'll never forget it. Uh, in the Great Hall of the People, the two most charismatic people I think I've been around, Ronald Reagan, you know, this elegant, tan movie actor from California, and Deng Xiaoping, four foot 11, <laughs> a firebrand powerful from Sichuan. Person. Unbelievable. These guys come together, shake hands, it was electricity, in the middle of the Great Hall of the People, and then Deng signals Reagan to go sit in the big seats. And Deng's feet didn't even touch the ground. <laughs> and he lit up one of those cigarettes, those long life cigarettes that he'd smoke without filters on them, and he had the spittoon right next to him there. And, and he sat there and banter with Reagan. No notes, no talking points. They just became friends. And I watched not knowing that I'd be that much involved in U.S.-China relations in, in utter amazement that uh, you could find two world leaders carry on like that. And then I compared and contrasted that to President Obama's first trip to China. Not that one is necessarily better than the other. It's more a story about how formal and high stakes our relationship has become with so much on the line. Talking points, cold rooms, you know, you don't veer from your script at all. We're competitors. We're competitors. Uh, and uh, the environment was so different uh, based on the early days compared to where we are today. And what the difference is, you know, Reagan, you know, hit Carter and then he embraced the Chinese and built a pretty good relationship during his years. Uh, George Bush uh, became president, who had been ambassador uh, to China, knew something about it, and all hell broke loose in Beijing with the Tiananmen Square massacre. Right. Of all people who could have maybe stepped in with China background, it would have been George Bush, which is to say that China always surprises. And then, of course, Bill Clinton ran on you know, the butchers of Beijing. What did he do? He engaged. He's probably the most popular president. With Jiang Zemin. Other than, he went over and spent a whole week, as he did in India. And he's remembered in India for the same reason, going around and meeting with people and eating in the little restaurants and just being himself. Yeah. And, and the people really connected. Uh, and he left with a great relationship with the Chinese. And then you get, uh, you get George W. who comes in, takes a, a harder line. The Chinese are interesting in that they like to size you up. 
They like to put you to the paces. They like to test you when you're first in office, throw things at you to see how you're gonna respond, and then they kind of have figured you out, and they know how to deal with you for the next four years or the next eight years. So but they used to tell me, we know, we know George W. Bush. He wears all his emotions on his sleeve. We could size him up that fast, and that's just the way he was. President Obama, he's a little more difficult to figure out. He's cold, he's contained, you don't quite know what you're gonna get, and it's very, very interesting. So the next president, likely to be the same thing, pound, pound, pound during the campaign, somebody gets in the Oval Office and it's like, geez, this is the relationship, this is what I've gotta do, I've gotta forge a working, meaningful partnership with China, or all these things are gonna happen, uh, and then you gotta figure out a strategy at that point. So who should the next president be? Oh. And, and when you, oh. you look at that, that. I'll leave that to the good voters of America. Okay, let me ask it a different way. You look at that lineup. I've watched three of the four Republican debates, and you've got those multiple candidates. Uh, this is a tough job. You need to run this complex United States government. You need to deal with 50 governors, all sorts of divisive social and political issues here at home in our dysfunctional capital. And you've got to be the strongest leader in the world dealing with war and peace issues and handle the Chinese. Yeah. Doesn't, I just look at that lineup, I say, I want someone who's run something, maybe who's run a state, on, on, in both parties, right. who's been a cabinet officer, who's actually dealt with the world. Right. And there are a couple of candidates up there who have no experience to be president. Agree? You, you, or, want, you want judgment and you want temperament. Yeah. So what came to mind when you're first elect, elected governor and you have to uh, start appointing judges and uh, giving people high positions, you know, you say, you know, does political affiliation matter? And I'd say, no. Uh, I want somebody who's got the temperament uh, and who's got the disposition and bearing and the wisdom and the judgment to be able to be a good judge. I don't care what your political party is. You know, so long as you've got a good track record that's sort of consistent with sort of my own philosophy. Experience. That's, experience matters. But the George Bush example I gave you was citing the best China hand we've ever had in the presidency and what happens Tiananmen Square. So, and it's almost, it, the, the trajectory is almost always the same. And, and I could see President Obama trying to develop a meaningful relationship his first couple of years. And it was hard. And things kept happening and we had all kinds of things that went haywire just based on what history throws at you. And every president has it. And I think he then made the calculation that there isn't any political upside in this relationship. I think I'll manage the downside to make sure the bottom doesn't fall out, and it isn't always a negative headline issue, but I'm not gonna maximize the upside. Right. Which is a calculation a president can make, obviously. So here's a question from a member in the audience um, about a big problem. President Obama has just announced a very ambitious project, Trans-Pacific Partnership, free trade agreement among 12 countries in the Asia Pacific region, some from Latin America, 40% of the global GDP is represented and China is not part of it. I think the strategy is we want China to play by the rules. It's not currently playing by the rules. By establishing this free trade agreement, China will have to begin to adhere on intellectual property rights to fair practice and then they can get in. Is that the right strategy? Do you think China will eventually join and will it have that effect on China? I think the TPP is part of our ultimate soft power in, in the region. I see this sort of economics as being a little bit of soft power. So when I live in Asia during the summer months, uh, you hear from the leaders and from the people there, this trade deal is really important in keeping us all together for investment trade, the facilitation of job growth, so on and so forth. Um, and so it's important for U.S. credibility to do this one and do it right and to make sure that labor and environmental standards, which are kind of new components to trade agreements, are done right and that the standards are high. Because the standards are high, it's gonna be really tough for these other 11 capitals, uh, they're reviewing it now just as we are, to come back and say, oh, we're okay with it, no changes needed. This is gonna be a fight probably all through the year and very, very complicated. Listen, I used to negotiate as- You were a trade the USTR. negotiator. You know, the bilateral free trade agreements, like with Singapore, Australia, and some of the others, it's hard enough dealing capital to capital when you've got 12 capitals involved in agreeing to the same template. It is really, really difficult. But I've watched the Chine Chinese attitude change from one of bluster and belligerence as if to say you're locking up our, our key economic partners and bringing them closer to you to, 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 to a friendlier approach. We welcome right. TPP. Right. This is a good thing. 
I think they're making a long-term calculation that at some point they're going to want to connect. See, they've already got their own TPP in the region. It's called RCEP, the Regional uh, Economic whatever it is. Uh, and it includes their free trade uh, partners in ASEAN. It includes India. And it includes a couple in Northeast Asia. So they've got their own version of TPP. Uh, it's done at a lower standard where you, if you look at what was negotiated, it doesn't include protection for intellectual property. Labor and environmental standards aren't included. Some aspects of trade facilitation aren't. I think they're making the calculation that ultimately they want to be able to integrate both visions of trade to help facilitate uh, trade overall. Otherwise, you've got two blocks that are uh, uh, bound for head-on collision. This is a treaty, so the Constitution says the Senate has to ratify it. Um, will the Democratic Party defeat President Obama on, tr on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Will he have the votes? I think he'll have the votes. I think it'll be very, very close. Uh, I remember, as a trade negotiator at the time, getting Trade Promotion Authority in 2002 under George W. Bush. And I think it carried by two votes. And I'll never forget the young congresswoman from North Carolina, I think it was, who made the final determining vote. Tears coming down her cheeks as she made the vote because she knew that she'd lost her seat by uh, voting in favor of it. But the president and White House put so much pressure on her that she, she felt she had no choice. And sure enough, she lost her seat. But it carried by two votes, which is to say, these trade agreements always are by a very, very slow. NAFTA margin. was, yeah. And, but you know, they're, they're pushed by Republicans and Democrats. I think it's been a part of US policy, at least in the post-World War II GATT WTO world for the most part. It's been, a, it's been an instrument of national policy. But the president seems to have Republican support, not quite enough Democratic support. You think he'll get enough to pass? I, I think he'll have enough, yeah. So here's a question from the audience with the reverse situation, where Republicans are very upset with the president on this EPA decision on coal. The president is now leading the world with the Chinese in kind of a joint venture towards a global compact on climate change, maybe to be announced in the next two or three weeks, three weeks uh, in Paris. It'll be the first global compact to reduce carbon emissions. And the question is, uh, will the Chinese agree to a binding agreement um, to reduce their carbon emissions at this, uh, at this conference? Will they meet us halfway? I think they will, but what's your, I except think for the binding they, part of it? I think they will. The, the Chinese, um, and I actually did, it's gonna sound really strange coming from a Republican, but I actually did work as governor on climate, climate change uh, with our Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was sounds, then, it sounds who was then governor actually. of California. And the two of us were involved in, in a Western agreement that uh, uh, didn't turn out so well on the presidential campaign trail. But that's another so, story, Nick. Uh, okay. But, I, but, but what I learned, so I had a little bit of a head start going over to China because I'd worked some of the issues uh, domestically. I had some sensitivity for them. The Chinese see this as, 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 as sort of one of those cornerstones of the U.S.-China relationship in the sense that it's part of the global aspect of our bilateral relationship. And I think given the push by the people at the grassroots level to do something about it, they're extra incentivized to show up with a deal that is binding. And I think all eyes are going to be on the Indians to see if they can come right. on board, because I think the Indians under Modi are less inclined They're to They're the outlier. They're the outliers, and they could take a good part of the sort of unaligned world uh, with them uh, at the Paris conference. So I think the United States and China are pretty much together on the contours of a deal they'd like to have. You know, together we've got peak emissions by 2030, uh, kind of a renewable portfolio standard as part of that ramp up. I'm guessing China already in their own internal plans had 2030 as a time for peak emissions, but still it's gonna be a, an enormously complicated and challenging job. For and what encourages me, John, is that this is the first time that I can remember that China and the United States have taken on a big global problem together, working in a positive direction. So hopefully we can build on this in other areas. We work better when we've got something to do. Yeah. And uh, what brought us together in 1972? The, the collective threat of the Soviet Union. Right. And that brought us together, and it kept us together, and we did all kinds of things together that most Americans had never imagined. Yeah. Uh, in the spirit of keeping the Soviets at, at bay, and, and I've always thought when we have something to do together, when our focus is on something bigger and aspirational, the relationship generally does better than when we don't have something visionary, and then it kind of becomes a tit for tat based on the headline of the day. Agreed. We have time for one more question. And I want to thank the audience for these great questions. This is a great concluding question. How is Hillary Clinton as a boss? 
<laughs> and do you think her executive ex experience at the State Department would help her be a good executive in the White House? When you're a diplomat, you're supposed to say nothing when there's something to say. <laughs> but there's something to say there's here. something when there's nothing to say. You're, you're always caught between a cliche and an indiscretion. I would, I would have but to you say. But you did work. You and, worked. And you I, reported to the president through I, I Secretary did. Clinton. I, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I found her to be hardworking. I found her to be professional. Uh, she did her homework. She read the briefing books. I sat through more hours in tea houses with Dai Bing Guo, uh, who was saying her counterpart. Yeah. Uh, and, and I saw her behind the scenes. And, uh, and I thought she was pretty good. And I've always told my Republican friends that you know there's, there's a lot more to Hillary Clinton than you might be sizing up just based on the popular press and the partisan talking points. Uh, I, I found her to be a, a, a determined, hardworking professional. And, uh, and so I, I like to see the good in all people. And I, 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 I did enjoy my working relationship with her, I have to tell you. This is a high note of bipartisanship in the United States. <laughs> so Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.